Thank you for tuning in to West Windsor Church. I'm Dr. Paul Wall, the pastor, and I'm glad that you are here with us online. We are continuing to hope and pray that we will soon be able to start up services again. And in particular, we are focusing on Mother's Day. And so be in prayer about that, and maybe there will be a way we can uh, open our church doors on Mother's Day. So you be in prayer about that. And I'm so glad that uh, many of you are tuning in and subscribing to the P-Wall station on YouTube. I want to also mention that I have just discovered that I can insert my sermon outline, not my whole sermon sheet, but my outline into the comments, into the comments underneath your YouTube video section if you're watching on your laptop or on a desktop computer or even at home. Uh, you can go underneath there and go to the comments and my sermon outline will be there and that will make it easier for you to follow along very specifically with me. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to go back into the book of Revelation again. I thank you, Lord, that uh, I was so excited from everything last week that I felt without question we needed to stay one more week in it. And so, Lord, we pray that as we look at the ninth verse of chapter 7 and begin examining more fully the great beauty of that large crowd crop harvest of souls that comes from all of the farming methods that you've instituted before chapter 7 and verse 2 and then into verse 9. Lord, help us really enjoy what your word says and help us get excited about living this out with you in this most amazing of all times. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we uh, look at today's message, I wanted to um, go over four things I have run across in the last week that specifically uh, deal with COVID-19 and how important it is for all of us to have a sense of humor as we uh, go and begin our lives each and every day with the Lord uh, facing uh, this COVID-19 virus that has unbelievably shut everything down. And uh, right now we're moving in, into a, an era where we have flattened the curve somewhat and people are thinking about starting up their businesses and uh, getting things somewhat back to normal. Well, most people would agree that it won't be back to normal for probably 12 to 24 months. We're going to see the face masks. We're going to see a lot more uh, hand washing gel and the like. And so some people are coming up with some pretty good humor that uh, I wanted to share with you as we begin. The first one is, a fellow walked up to me and said, I know a great joke. I know you're always looking for jokes, Paul. I know a great one about the coronavirus, but I don't think you'll get it. Okay. Secondly, there's a a person who walks into a restaurant that serves beer. Nothing unusual about that. And that person says to the order taker, I'll have a Corona, please, but hold the virus. <laughs> and then the third one, this is scary. If I get quarantined for two weeks with my spouse and I die, I can assure you it was not the virus that killed me. Okay. And then lastly, with all this talk about the coronavirus, the people who are making sanitizing gel 
are rubbing their hands together thinking about all the money they're going to make. <laughs> okay, let's go and look at your sermon outline. And Harvesting into a Large Crowd is the title that we have given to this message. And as we think about this crop of souls, many of you, I, I hope and pray, are like myself as you've entered into the first seven chapters of the book of Revelation. You see that there's a misuse of the word wrath, the wrath of God, as is normally in verses chapters 5 through chapter 7. Actually, the word wrath should be translated a moving of the soul, a movement of the soul. And you'll see, if you are able to get the scripture sheet, that we describe the word orge, O-R-G-E, as it's put into English, it is translated the movement of the soul. Therefore, we look at it as a farming movement. And so God is orchestrating all these things for one reason. And it's not about wrath. It is about farming. It is about de-weeding. It is about the removal of weeds. You see, when a farmer goes out to a field, he isn't saying, oh, I hate these weeds. He is saying, I love the crop that I'm going to get this year. And I need to remove the weeds so that the crop can grow properly. Okay, Versus, I'm just really mad and angry and wrathful toward those, those, those weeds. Okay, That's not the way anybody thinks. You want to just remove the weeds so you get your great crop. That's what the title is about. God has been doing all sorts of weeding methodology or weeding activities so that He can easily see that this is a weed and remove it. This is a true believer and they're set aside. And all of that is going on. Um, And now we're seeing for the first time, we're really going to be looking at this harvest of souls that has come about through the farming movement of God. And as we look at that, uh, it's very, very exciting. Um, I'm going to read from my outline. As we see God at work, farming, removing the weeds, the tares from the main crop of souls, we watch with great wonder how great it is to know that Jesus was sent into the world because God loves the world. And now we are still in the sixth seal. Even though we're in chapter 7, we're still in the sixth seal, and a part of that is this revelation of this large crowd of souls that have been won through God's farming methods. In the sixth seal, we talked about last time the angel with the signet seal, the signet seal. Many of you have seen rings that have signets on them. And lo and behold, a giant fertilized harvest conversion of soul's crop is revealed and is right before us. And so we're going to look at three uh, elements or parts of this group, this large crowd right now. The first one is, We're transitioning in the sixth seal and the revealing of the sixth signet seal. And suddenly there's a vast, impressive crop, big crowd of people that we're suddenly going to see. And on the back of your uh, sermon sheet, you'll see that angel pictured there with its signet on its ring. And it is sealing all of the believers. 
And we have talked about how that happened in the days of Rome when there was an awful lot of suffering going on, similar to what is described here. And many people feel interpretation should be given to the Roman Empire uh, and, and how the suffering led to this vast crop of people who came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we look at this passage, we're going to just interpret it so that in the future, when the world is nearing its end, this great signet seal will be put upon all people who say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not going to talk about the rapture, um, whether it has or hasn't happened yet. We are not today going to talk about uh, the rapture and whether it's a mid-tribulation experience or a post-tribulation experience. Um, we're, we, we are considering ourselves in the first half of two tribulation periods, though, and that's what we're looking at here. When we enter into the second phase, that will be something that I believe will be more like the way God will defeat Satan, the way God the Father will, with Jesus and the Spirit's help, defeat Satan, the devil, and his kingdom of darkness that I believe does rule this world, even though people like you and me can apply kingdom of God principles to our lives so that the darkness does not even touch us because we are connected to Jesus the light without condemnation, without judgment. And instead we get the light and we follow that light and we are led by the light and um, so it will be in these tribulation times as well. And so that first transition of the sixth seal, eventually we get to this vast, impressive, large crop of souls. First point. Second point, we're going to be transitioning with this sixth seal, which reveals a big saving crowd. But now... We're going to really look at what is the celebration all about? What are they celebrating? And it will give you and me a good view of who Jesus and his Father are as they bring about the closing of this phase of the universe that we know that is talked about here. And there's a big celebration because of this vast Group of souls that have been won. Thirdly, the sixth seal reveals some of the ways that the celebrating will happen. The ways it will happen. Uh, that will be the third point we will get into. And we will move all the way through to verse 12 and then end on verses 13 and 14. Okay, as I... Read verses 5 through 8. I'm going to be reading, um, I will be reading <clears throat> on your outline there, under A, 144,000, the first big crop of the mysterious number of all the Israel tribes, okay? We're, we touched that last time, I wanted to remind you, that was the first large group of souls, that were one in the midst of all of these farming methods. B, Revelation Zoom. The Zoom cam reveals now an exclusive crowd. All-inclusive crowd. So let us go to verse 9. After these things I looked. I'm going to read from the easy-to-read version. And there was a large crowd of people. They were farming harvested crop converts. There were so many people that no one could count all of them. They were from every nation, every tribe, every race of people, every language spoken on the earth. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They all wore white robes 
and had palm branches in their hands. And so we will stay with verse 9 as we go through our first point, this vast, impressive crop. On your outline, you, so, you see C. Lo, a great harvest crop of all tribes and nations. D, we are reminded that this is due to the wind blowing in the new covenant. Sometime, go to John chapter 3. Read verses 1 through 20, 21. And as you read those verses, realize that Jesus is having a conversation with a man called Nicodemus, whom we can call Nick. And that whole conversation is about being born again or entering into renewal. That is all about the wind of the Spirit at that particular time, starting with Jesus all the way through the end of Jesus coming back again. All the wind is continuing to blow through the new covenant, the New Testament, showing us new ways of doing things. All of the reason, the reason we were able to reach all these other people and not just Israelites is because it went, it, the gospel, went to all the world. And it's important as new covenant believers as people who witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ and say, oh my, that is irresistible, as Andy Stanley said. It is so irresistible. Get the book if you haven't read it yet and read it. It is so irresistible that I'm going to put my faith in the risen Lord Jesus and I am going to listen for him and to him as he speaks to me every day as he leads and guides me, because I want him to. And then we are led into the way the wind blows in God leading us to other people. First, God leads us to ourselves under the new commandment where Jesus said, there's only two now, love God, love yourself, and then I, God, will lead you to your neighbor, to your others. First you get that vertical going so you know you're right with God. And then you go to your neighbor. Somebody says, how do I know I'm right with God? It's extremely simple. It's not about you being perfect. It's not about you being without sin. It is about you having faith in Jesus and in his resurrection and in him being in your life. Okay? That is what the New Covenant, the New Testament is all about. It's about faith that Jesus is active in my life and he will lead me and he will guide me and I will better myself and I will better others and he will lead me where? Friend, he may lead you around the entire world. He may lead you to a new tribe of people. He may lead you to a language that has never been spoken before. He may lead you to a group of people or to a nation that you have never been to before. All because that is the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. That is the new covenant that was entered into. And so there's this harvest, a large crowd of harvested souls that have come out of this first tribulation period. And they are all standing there. And, and John is very, feels it is very, very important to distinguish now each one of these various groups. But you and I must remember, it is because we left the old covenant and entered into the new covenant with Jesus through the blowing wind of the Spirit that led us into the new covenant. When Jesus caught, was, was brought, the woman caught in adultery, the old covenant said, stone her to death. The new covenant said, Jesus said, where are your accusers now? Where are your condemners now? She said, 
Well, when you said, he who is without sin cast the first stone, they all left. And then Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Now look at me as the light. And in this light of who I am revealing to you, that you have your own life to look after, and you have your portion, your share in this world that is set apart for you to get to. If you keep committing adultery, you won't get your portion. You won't get your share. You will be robbed of it. And see, that is the difference between Old Covenant and New Covenant. The New Covenant says, get to the light. And Jesus said, I am the light. And right here, right now, all these people have come to the light They have all come out of tribulation and they are standing before the Lord. And notice, as I like to um, break down these verses and say that we're now at nine, the F part, meaning there's been an A, B, C, D, E part already. We're at F. All languages, races of people reached. And notice in that phrase, the different races of people. If God loves every race of people, friends, doesn't that mandate you and I must love all people, regardless of their skin color, okay? Regardless of this style or that style or this way or that way, they are who Jesus died for. They are a part of this conversion, this large conversion in Revelation 7, 9, and that F part. Reminding us that all these races in the new covenant, God wants to reach every human being there is. Okay, now we see in, we take a step back and we look at Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. And you'll see on the back of your sermon sheet the fourth seal on that top right picture and you see that it is called the pale horse pestilence or plague and notice it says one quarter of mankind dies God is doing all the various things in your life and my life to bring us to see his love, okay? You're going through a hard time right now. Have you said, Lord, are you trying to tell me something? Are you doing this to bring me closer to you? I had a a brother one year younger than me. He died. And through the process of him dying, which was about eight years, God used that and my broken heart to lead me to him so that I could walk with Jesus the rest of my life and have a smaller burden. Because Jesus said, come to me and I will make your burden smaller. I will lessen it because of the ways I will show you to live in this dark world. Well now, think about COVID-19. Oh my. We We are all scared, aren't we? We are all focused on how if we open up the economy now, which I kind of believe is going to happen. If it opens up, some will no doubt enter into that virus. And then there will be um, death possibly. There will be sickness. Uh, there will be fear. Okay, And we must pray that God uses this to bring our nation back to a revival. But we see very clearly, don't we, here, in Revelation 6, verses 7 and 8, this pale green horse, and how at that time, it says, actually 25% of the world will be wiped out. Isn't it amazing? For the first time in the history of our land that we can remember, some would say, well, if you go back to the Spanish flu in the early part of the 1900s, Uh, They did the same thing, or a lot of communities did the same thing. You're right. But I, being 
a little bit over 39, haven't uh, seen that kind of thing too often in my life. And so it is here. And so we want to uh, be reminded as we're looking at the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9, that uh, this is um, a way in which God works to get our attention so that we see his light in the darkness of COVID-19. And it's my prayer that uh, you ask the Lord into your heart and mind and soul if you haven't yet. And you can even do that right now. And I'll allude to it again as I close. But we see then, uh, on your outline under F, the command center. Uh, Usually that's called the throne of God. But we see that it's the Father in command of all these farming movements. Jesus is shown as the Lamb who has already died so that everyone can come to the Father through Jesus, led by the Spirit. And and so all of this is happening. And so 25% of the world's population in Revelation chapter 6, and that pale green horse, pass away so that the others have an opportunity to come to him. Someone says, well, what about if they die? Do you think that God still loves them? God loves every person in this world, past, present, and future. And he always makes a way for them to say, I want you, Lord. And then he's so happy to receive them through their faith in the Lord Jesus. Okay, G, notice the lamb in the next part of verse 9. They were standing before the lamb. They were standing before the throne, God's throne, the command center. And they saw what the father was doing. But then they focused on the lamb, Jesus. And we remember when he was being brought to the cross, he remained silent like a lamb going to be slaughtered, okay? And so he did that so that your sins and my sins could be taken up by him, put on that cross, and therefore be done away with. And then we could enter into this new life where we see God's love for us in that first commandment, And we reply with our heart and our mind and soul in the second commandment. And we say, I love you, God. I'm with you. I'm committed to you. It's the only thing that makes sense in this world. And off we go together. And so this vast group of people who have already done that see the Lamb in heaven now for the first time. And what do they do? What do they do? Notice H. The white robes symbolize the righteousness through faith. They all wore white robes. Are you struggling right now with some kind of sin? Are you struggling with some way in which you don't feel good about yourself, maybe because of this action or that action? Friend, remember, condemnation is not the way Jesus works. If you are feeling condemned, you need to get rid of that condemnation. How? Please tell me how. You do it by putting your faith in Jesus. And then you hear Jesus say to you as you read his word, as you fellowship with other believers, you hear him say, and as you pray, he says to you, I love you. I died for you. Everything is working toward you to find your niche, to find why I created you, to find your purpose-driven life, and then I'm going to be with you and help you live that out. And you see, friends, there's no room for condemnation in that. There's no room for feeling a sentence of some kind of judgment upon yourself. Get rid of all of that. And replace it with the receiving of the Lord Jesus by faith. And when you receive Jesus Christ by faith, you get a white robe, just like all of them. Do you get it because you earn it? 
No, you don't. You get it because you have put your faith, your faith in Jesus. Just as I put my faith in some chair to hold up when I sit on it, and then I get to sit there, so I put my faith in Jesus, and then I live my life out with him, and through him, and in his light. And then I get a white robe, okay? And as I'm living my life, I feel the white robe that I'm already in. And my sins are forgiven because of my faith in Jesus, not because I'm good, not because I am without sin, but because I have put my faith in Jesus. Just like these people have, this large crowd wearing white robes. Friend, I hope you can feel right now your white robe. I hope you can put it on and say to the, say to the Lord Jesus, who is infinitely capable of doing everything, how do I look, Lord? And I think he'll say, I love your faith. Keep it up. Continuing on, the white robes real, symbolize righteousness through faith. Number two, the white robes symbolize Jesus' purity, sinlessness in his life. So the whiteness, the pure snow, if you will, is Jesus is the one who lived the perfect life, the life without sin. The one who was able to die physically and yet rise from the dead because he and the Father are one and were one. And when he died on the cross, the Father was right there with him and he said, Into your hands, Father, I commend, I give my spirit. You see, they were together in the death and in the resurrection. And then one of the transferences of his resurrection further was when he saw Mary and he said, Don't touch me, Mary. I'm in a process of being transfigured and transformed by my Father. So that I can be both in heaven and on earth in the same way. Don't touch me. I believe if Mary would have touched him, she probably would have died. And so she stayed back and recognized his purity. Uh, untouchableness, really, at that particular moment. They were holding palm branches, verse 9 continues toward the end of it, which is part of what happened when Jesus was going into Jerusalem, right? They took out these palm branches, these green branches. The newness of life seen in that green. I remember once going to an eye doctor and I said to the doctor, what do you think is the best source of food I can use for my eyes? And he said, Paul, a lot of people talk about this or that, but I say this to you, spinach. Eat spinach. It has all of the ingredients that have more to do with health for your eyes than anything else. And they were holding palm branches which are green like spinach, symbolizing the newness of life that was about to come. And so we see the palm branches again, don't we? This time, as they're looking at the victorious lamb versus the lamb that was being, going to be slaughtered right in front of them. Number four, the hands can symbolize, then, symbolize also this idea of waving the palms and the waving of the life, the new life of green, the waving of the new life of, of light, and worshiping God. And it is what one of the things that we all miss so much by not being able to physically go to church and lift up our hands and say, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. And raise the other hand and say, yes, I feel your presence. And all of those things are going on as they're expressing their thankfulness in Revelation 7 and verse 9 now. Now we're going to transition to the second point. The second point revealing this celebration that happens. Okay, notice verse 10. 
They shouted loudly, Victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I'll read now from the modern King James Version. And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation sitting to God, sitting on the throne, the command center, and to the Lamb. I don't know about you, but when I am with my grandchildren, and I have four grandchildren under the age of six right now, and so as you can well imagine, there's a lot of crying that goes on, uh, you know, when I'm with them. Um, someone will take a, you know, the baby's rat, 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 rattle away or their toy away or something will happen that isn't right and off they go crying. Well, what do they usually do when they cry? They get loud. They get loud. And so out of this large, vast crowd, there's a big celebration about the saving that God did. And I have carefully used that word saving, Okay. Because, you see, they were involved with God saving them out of the tribulation into heaven. And so I think the word saving, when applied to Jesus, is the most important word of all. Because when you're being saved by Jesus, or when you're involved in the saving power of Jesus... You are already saved. You have already given your life to him. Salvation is a part. But what people need more and more and more than ever today is to be connected to the saving power of Jesus right now. And that's what they're cheering about. That's what the big celebration is about. That they came into touch with that And they're crying, they're shouting, they're in an uproar because they found the Lamb and the Father, and they're exciting. Now, notice in verse the second part of verse 10, it says, Victory belongs to the Father and the Son. And that word victory, think about winning, think about conquest. Think about success and all those things and what it means. Uh, These people were able to come out of a tough situation and they entered into victory and they used the word victory when saying, Father and Jesus, thanks for the victory. Whatever you're going through right now, God can give you the victory as you go through it. God can give you the ability to be thankful, even though you may be in great pain. Say, Lord, show me how I can be thankful. You see, by doing that, you're planting a seed of faith and asking God to be with you and touch you and show you. And so that's another part of the big celebration, is they're thanking God for the victory that they have found in God's saving power that brought them to that place. C, remember as with all things related to Jesus, it is he the lamb with the father. So much of the new covenant is based on those two alone, right? Jesus was constantly more than consistently saying the Father and I are one. And when he was healing people, he was healing them, saying the Father is leading me to do this. Remember, when you're praying to Jesus, acknowledge the Father in your prayers too, because the two of them are together, just as they are here, just as Jesus was alluding to him all the while he was on the earth for three years talking about what was going on. He and the Father together. So when you have your faith in Jesus, say to Jesus, show me more of your Father. And you know what? He will. And it is glorious. And it fills you with 
joy. It will fill you with praise. It will fill you with a desire to be more of who God created you to be than you can ever imagine. And that's one of the things the New Testament speaks of loudly and clearly, is that when you see Jesus in his light, not in condemnation, not in judging, but in his light, that then you see him in ways where he and the Father do things in your life that cause you to be in a life that is greater than anything you could have possibly imagined. And friends, that's even greater than being positive. That is greater than even the greatest of positive thinking. It is just being in awe of the power and greatness of God. And all of these in the saving big crowd that were revealed suddenly, they're all sharing in that. Okay, so go to D, the lamb gets praised, the father on the command center as well. And the lamb and the father are together. We've touched this. Second point, these people are noticing the farming fertilizer for the crop. Oh, look at the bad smelling applications that must have happened. The other week, uh, I'm glad that in COVID-19, they're still allowing people like me who have the habit of playing safe distance tennis, where you play tennis and you're with a group of two or four people and you're out on the court, you're not near each other. I even wear a plastic glove when I pick up the ball. But, but we were out playing a group with a group of doubles and some of, some of them have a connection to our church. And all of a sudden, somebody looked at the other and said, stop serving. Oh my goodness, can you smell that fertilizer? Because we were in an area that was surrounded by big healthy farms. And boy, you could just smell with your senses all of that. And you see, this is what this first part of the tribulation period is about. There's a lot of things that are happening. And um, and it's a farming method to get this big saving crowd together. There's a purpose behind it. Thirdly, they are being praised for separating the weeds from the crop. One of the things the New Testament says to you and me about weeding is it says this, don't you or me ever try to weed. Don't try to ever pull a weed out. Jesus makes it clear in his parable of the end times and the farmer and the separating weeds. He says, that's not your job. That means don't do it. You see, it always leads you and me back to this very more simplified life which says it's about God and it's about me. God is going to handle the de-weeding. God is going to do that separation. And when we let him do it, we're free to do our own thing and not get entangled in weeds and not get entangled in thorns and not get entangled in things that can bring us down. And if you've been brought down and you now see what I'm referring to, give that weeding thing that you're trying to hold on to. Say, God, take it away from me. Replace it with something new. And Lord, even if I feel like I'm lost for a while in the newness of what you're replacing it with, that'll be a good thing. I'll enjoy being lost because Jesus said he came to save that which was lost. And I'll be glad to go through that process. A big reminder, continuing under D, that let God separate the weeds. You and me stay out of the way. And then fifthly, the giant victory comes both currently now and in the future crop. As you and I practice these things in the new covenant, as we see the Father, as we see Jesus, the Lamb, and we're involved by faith, all of these things um, actually become very revealed to us as well. And we get into our own saving. And then we have a big celebration where? In the churches that will one day soon be reopened. Amen? Amen. 
Number, third, number three, transitioning sixth seal reveals some of the ways, some of the ways that celebrating happens. Okay, let's look at uh, verses 9 through 12. Um, you should have those before you. But in particular, notice the uh, beginning of verse 11. The elders and the four living beings were there. And so there's this, this reminder that all of these that were a part of the beginning of the book of Revelation are still there. They're still involved. And that's one of the great purposes of the church, friends, is that when you're involved in a church and you stay in that church and you serve in that church, you get to know all the different people in that church and find all sorts of different ways that you can help in the church. One time I had someone say to me, you know, I think I just want to go to a church where I don't know anyone. Well, you see, you want to be in a place where you get to know, you serve, you keep working things out, you keep loving one another, because Jesus said, that's another commandment I give you. God, you are leading you to your neighbor and then love one another as I have loved you. You can't love one another if you're constantly moving from one church to another. I just encourage you to find a place where you can settle down and really uh, get into a ministry that God has for you. And he will lead you there. Okay, so these others are there and they're before they're bowing. Notice how they're falling before, verse 11. The elders and the four living creatures or beings were there. All the angels were standing around them and around the throne or the command center. The angels bowed down on their faces before the throne and they worshipped God. Modern King James Version says they fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. God. And so that is what is happening because they're a part of this big saving crowd. And this is the way celebrating happens in your life and in my life. Um, you, you get to express, Lord, I thank you that through your light and your lessened burden that I was able to touch your blessing. That I was able to receive a blessing from you. And I know more are to come. These are some of the things they were saying. You have blessed us and saved us and we're here in heaven. Thank you for this blessing, God. And then they said, oh, the glory of you, Father, and Jesus together and how you planned this together and how you did it together. There is a an aura about that. There is a glory that is unbelievable. And we praise you for that. Thank you for giving us glimpses of it. We see it as we're looking at you now. And then, oh, the power of Jesus and the Father together, right? Producing the resurrection. The only religion in the world that is built upon an actual Someone dying and rising from the dead and going on into a, 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 a life beyond imagination and excitement. There's power in that, isn't there? There's power. And then the, the might being seen maybe in the hands of Jesus and then being seen in the hands of the Father being seen in the eyes of the Father and in the eyes of Jesus. And then this whole notion of that they are going to be able to be with the Father and Jesus forever, for all of eternity. And this is one of the ways that celebration happens too, because they touch it and they see that as well. And then lastly, the transition verse, verses 13 and 14. We're going to go there uh, quickly. Then one of the elders asked me, this is the easy to read version, 
Who are these people in white robes? Where did they come from? And John, in this vision, says, You know who they are, sir. And the elder said, These are the ones who have come out of the great suffering, the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in and with the blood of the Lamb, and they are clean, and they are white. And so God uses that question from the elders, from an elder, to even magnify more so the glory of this scene that happens right as we're getting closer to the seventh seal being opened, which you can see actually starts in Revelation 8 and verse 1, where it says, The Lamb opened the seventh seal. And oh my goodness, what happened then? There was silence in heaven for half an hour. I hope that in your life right now, if you feel you're in the midst of a bunch of silence, Maybe you're suffering with COVID-19. Maybe you're suffering because something has happened to you in your life. I urge you to turn your life over to the Lord Jesus and pray with me and say, Lord Jesus, you died and you rose again. And now you're active with the Father in ways beyond belief. And I'm beginning to sense and see them. And I want to be a part of you in this world, with my life, which will have purpose. So I say to you, Lord, I come to you. I give myself to you. And I urge you to say this, Jesus, I give my heart to you right now. I want you to take over my life right now. I put myself in you, O Lord Jesus. Come into my heart and take over. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I thank you and hope you have done that as you, as you have listened. And there will be ways in which in our, some of our future ministry uh, online that we'll be able to show you how you can contact our church, contact uh, me, and uh, say thank you. So thanks again for watching. God bless you.